AI not only has its impact on insurance. Combining ultra-resolution imagery with deep neural networks, let us understand masterpieces like Rembrandt's Nightwatch in completely new ways. Learn how AI was harnessed to create a 716 gigapixel image of the Nightwatch and how it enabled a virtual reconstruction of the pieces of the painting that were cut off more than 300 years ago. Robert Erdmann is a senior scientist at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and a professor at the University of Amsterdam as well. Most of his work involves creating neural networks and other software with the aim of understanding an artwork's physical state and how it was made. A big hand for Robert Erdmann. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, so as Monty Python might say, and now for something completely different. Um, so I'm uh, going to try to give you a high-level overview of, um, of my work. Um, I broadly define my mission as to help the world access, preserve, and understand its cultural heritage. Um, and so I'm fortunate to work at the Rijksmuseum. If you're not familiar, that's the Dutch National Museum of Art and History. Um, I'm American, as you can probably tell from my accent, but um, I've been working there since 2014. So this is going to be a high-level overview of artificial intelligence applied to helping us in our work uh, in the museum. Um, so to begin with, um, if I show you this, um, probably you don't think that AI has anything uh, to do with this. It's uh, actually one of the most famous and important objects in the Rijksmuseum. It's called the Vianen Ewer. Um, this object appears in more than 75 Dutch golden era um, paintings. And um, I was asked to make a movie of this thing at five meters wide projection to open an exhibition that we had about the object and the, the style called the Kvab style. Um, and so we took uh, hundreds of photos of the object while it was on a turntable. And then uh, the problem was that the movie needed to be uh, around three minutes long, but I only had enough, um, enough movies for around 45 seconds. And so you could put longer delays between the frames, but then it would look sort of like claymation, like you would be looking at one angle, and then it would hold for a long time, and then it would switch to the next, and so on. Um, so what you're seeing here, um, is an example of one of the many ways that AI is, is um, helping us in our work at the museum behind the scenes. It's not obviously AI, but um, this little movie here only has one quarter of its photographs as real photographs. So what you're seeing here is real photograph, fake, 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 real, fake, 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 real, fake, fake, fake. Um, so I had to um, design a neural network that would basically imagine what the missing frames looked like if we had taken four times as many photos as we actually did. So hopefully you can't tell which frames here are real and which ones are fake. Um, but yeah, hopefully most of the visitors to the exhibition had no idea that AI was behind the scenes. It's just a pretty, pretty moving picture. Um, something else that's important to understand about um, about my work is that 100% of it um, is online. So I'm just running this in a web browser that's connected back to the server that's running under my desk in my office. So this is all live. Nothing here is recorded. See, I can like swipe back and forth and zoom in and out and so on. <clears throat> um, another uh, example of how we use um, AI to help us understand um, the art, artworks better is, uh, is here. This is a small drawing. Um, by Rembrandt. It's only 14 centimeters high in, in real life, and um, it's thought to possibly be a drawing of his, of his wife, Saskia. She's wearing peasant's clothes, so there's some possibility that it's not her because Saskia was pretty high class. Um, but this, this drawing is uh, in the collection of the Rijksmuseum, and the way we photograph artworks is designed to flatten them, to treat them as if they're two-dimensional. Um, but in reality, every artwork even the flattest artwork is not flat. It has three-dimensional structure. And so the question is, what can we learn about how Rembrandt worked by using um, imaging uh, together with AI to help us to understand the three-dimensionality of this drawing? So what I have here is a visualization that will allow me to attach a virtual light source to the mouse. 
and to strip away all the color that comes from the ink and the paper and to only imagine this as if it is some chalk that has a three-dimensional structure. So now, as I'm moving the mouse around the screen, if I put it on the left side of the screen, then this is like light coming from the left. If I put it on the right side of the screen, this is light coming from the right, light coming from above, light coming from below, and so on. And so this is already really interesting because what you can see here, um, to begin with, if I'm putting the light on the left or right sides, you can see the so-called laid lines. These are part of the paper mold that was used to make the paper. So then we can learn something about where Rembrandt got his paper and see if he shared a paper uh, maker with other artists. Um, here you can see this horizontal line um, moving uh, left to right across uh, near the bottom of the screen. That's called a chain line. That's also part of the mold. Um, but really interesting is that if I show you where the ink is, if you look at her shoulder here, then you can see that the, the paper has actually puckered up a little bit because of how much ink he used and how it soaked into the shoulder and caused the fibers of the paper to gather up together. Um, so we can actually see a three-dimensional evidence of how he's laying down ink. And then, um, perhaps it's interesting to see them like this. Um, so now, if you look at the left and right images, you can see very clearly that there is a, a very sharp instrument was used to make these little scribbles, and so that actually presses harder into the paper, and it leaves behind evidence in the three-dimensionality that you usually can't see when you're looking at the ink of, uh, of some paper. Um, and then finally, it's also interesting to note that there have been some conservation treatments to this um, picture as shown here with light um, shining from various directions. This bit, which is normally invisible to the human eye, is revealed to have really quite some three-dimensional structure because it was a tear that was repaired by the conservators. Um, Uh, another unusual application of AI, most people think of AI um, when it comes to images as being useful for image recognition, um, is the case where we have a work on paper, and you're probably familiar with um, you having used fancy stationery that if you hold it up to the light, you can see a watermark in it. Um, so that's been the case for a long time that um, paper makers would put a little wire mark in their molds, and, and then if you hold the paper up to the light, you can see the watermark. But the problem is, and, and I, I should say that's really useful, because then if you can tell who made a certain paper, then you can date the work exactly, um, because even the watermark is changing over time as it wears out. So if you have a work on paper and you'd really like to know when and where it came from, then look at the watermark. But the problem is that it's covered with ink. So. Um, this is a neural network, uh, a little app that you can uh, upload images to. So you, you take a piece of paper and you put it on a, what's called a light board. So you shine light from behind and then you take your cell phone camera and you put it above and you take a picture of the light shining through the paper. And then you see the ink that's on the back and you see the ink that's on the front. And it's very jumbled and nearly impossible to read. But um, here I've trained an AI to, uh, I call this the magic eraser to understand what the ink um, is on the front and what the ink is on the back and to magically erase it as if it's not there. So this, for example, um, this is an image uh, of, of what goes in and this is what comes out. So this comes in here. This is what comes out. So now I can read the watermark. This is, uh, this is what comes in. So you can see there's sharp ink on the front and blurry ink on the back. This is what comes out, and now I can see the chain lines and the laid lines and the watermark. In, out, in, out, and so on. So this means that um, anyone who has the URL and a cell phone can um, take a photo of some uh, paper with transmitted light through it. And then a second AI, which I'm not going to show you today, will um, basically then look up this watermark in a huge database of uh, more than 300,000 watermarks and identify the watermark perfectly. And that can tell you where the paper came from. Um, next, um, I should. Uh, some uh, more familiar territory. Uh, this is Rembrandt's Night Watch. It's sort of the centerpiece of, uh, of the Rijksmuseum. It's a big picture. It's Rembrandt's largest. It's 454 centimeters wide, 378 centimeters tall. 
Um, and we're in the middle of uh, something, a project called Operation Night Watch that has two halves. The first half is about researching the picture, and the second half will, will be about conserving the picture. So we've uh, just recently finished with the research half, um, and one of my contributions to the research half was to make um, a five-axis robot, meaning a robot that can move left, right, up, down, forward, backward, and tilt the camera left and right, and tilt the camera up and down, to move over the surface of the painting with the highest resolution digital camera in the world, to make a 717 gigapixel image of the picture. So it's a, about a million pixels wide, about 700,000 pixels tall. It has a resolution of five microns, which means if you move one pixel to the right in the image, you're moving five millionths of a meter to the right in, uh, in the real world. To give you a sense of what five microns means, a human red blood cell is eight microns wide. My pixels are five microns wide. So let's see what you can do with that. Um, AI was required to stitch this all. I'm just going to turn on a little scale bar. So you can see here at the bottom right, there's a little, little scale that shows us um, how big things are. So I zoom into the cuff here. OK, that's nice. Five millimeters, two millimeters, one millimeter, 500 micrometers. So this little bar at the bottom right is half a millimeter wide. So at this point, um, I can see that Rembrandt has uh, has, has made a little swirl of paint. It's only uh, one and a half millimeters wide, but the paint is insufficiently mixed on his brush from taking it from the palette that I can see the three different pigments that he had on his palette here. Um, if I go nearby, I can see individual pigment particles. For example, this is a pigment particle of a pigment called smalt that comes from taking blue cobalt glass and grinding it up into a powder and putting it in, in uh, linseed oil and painting with it. Um, Um, many people like to think that this figure in the center of the screen is a little self-portrait of Rembrandt, where he draws himself in his painter's uh, beret peeking between the shoulders. Um, so it's interesting to zoom in all the way to the eye so we can see that the, the sort of what I like to call the mystery of mastery, how Rembrandt manages to make us see um, the glint of an eyeball from back here is actually just three carefully um, placed brush strokes. Um, this also allows me to see some conservation issues. For example, this is a, something called a lead soap. This happens when lead in the paint, um, lead white, for example, would react with potassium in the oil from the linseed oil. And over time, 50 to 100 years, let's say, will react to form a microscopic soapy uh, particle, spherical particle, that grows and grows and grows until it pokes its head out on the surface of the painting like a pimple. So that's what you see here. And then it will continue to grow and possibly fall out onto the floor, leaving behind a little crater, which is what you see here. So if I zoom into the face of uh, Wilhelm uh, van Rautenberg, you can see that they're actually all over the place. but. Now, as, um, as our responsibility is to care for the painting and to design a conservation treatment for it, it's really important to know where those are. Uh, also, interesting to note that we can see all of the past uh, retouches. So this is a place where, um, possibly in 1976, that someone went in. Yeah, this, this looks enormous here, but um, it's uh, only one and a half millimeters wide, so almost invisible to the human eye. Um, so this is a place where essentially um, the, the restorer has corrected the painting by, by touching it up a little bit, so it doesn't look like it has this blemish. Um, so that's zooming way in, so now let me zoom way out. Um, it's also interesting to um, have an AI. This is from 2015, so it's a little bit um, stale by now, but this is having an AI organize every single painting in the entire Rijksmuseum, 4,750 or so um, pictures, um, without any metadata to help it um, organize pictures uh, next to each other that it thinks are similar. So this is the 2015 neural network's view of what might be similar. So here's the famous Vermeer um, woman reading a letter in the Rijksmuseum. And you can see she's um, holding a letter. Her head is tilted down. She has her elbows bent. Um, and so nearby, you see figures that are in um, similar pose, and so on. 
Um, but AI has actually come quite a long way f uh, since then. So this is something new. Um, this is what's called a joint embedding, and a joint embedding allows me to um, mix text and images. So what I've done here is made a, a cultural heritage search engine. Um, so for example, a woman holding, uh, let's say, uh, wearing a, a blue dress holding a musical instrument. All I have to do is type what I'm looking for, and without any metadata on the images, it will find me images that match. So this is just a big pile of images. No labels have been provided by humans. It just knows how to read the images, and it knows how to read English. Um, so let's see. A woman stands by a window. Uh, in her hand is a letter that she is reading. And so on. Um, even weird things like um, an unusual staircase. So it's able to understand things like unusual or um, a delft where tile depicting a ship, let's say. So this is interesting, um, but I can also search, um, I can search by image. Um, so let's look for, um, uh, let's say, a Blanchard painting of Paris. Okay, so that I have lots of paintings of Paris. So let me pick one, and I'll, I'll just pick the URL for this. Um, copy image address. And if I put a URL up here instead of a query, then it will query by image. So it will find images that are similar to this one. So now I'm querying with an image. I could have pointed my phone at something, but there's no art um, here. So uh, what I can do now is mix the query that's coming from the image and a query that comes from English. So I can say, OK, I'm centered on this cloud of images that are like the one that I've uh, given it as the exemplar. But I want to move in the snow direction. And if I move in the snow direction, then I kind of lean, I move the cloud in the direction of snow in this very high dimensional space. And now I'm getting pictures that are related to my query, but, but also uh, related to snow, or let's say um, uh, warm cafe, uh, warm, glowing cafe lights. OK. So given that this is working on images that don't have any metadata associated with them, it's just a big pile of images, then um, I can possibly answer the question, who would be crazy enough to take a uh, 717 billion pixel of the Night Watch? Uh, like, no human can ever look at all those pixels. So what's the point? Well, um, I have microscopic resolution for this picture, so what I can do is cut it up into little tiles at the microscopic level. Now I have a, a collection of 14 million image tiles with no labels. So what I can do is, um, is query and say, I would like a photomicrograph with small white spots and a red background photomicrograph with small white spots and a red background. And now it makes a heat map for me. So I can say, ah, I see. So if I were to go there and zoom all the way in to the five micron level, I would find a photomicrograph with small white spots and a red background. Or if I come over here, um, yet more small white spots and a red background. Or what I could do is query um, by image. So here, if I come to one of the places where it was attacked um, with a knife and say I'm, I would like that to use that as an example instead of text, then it will make me a heat map that shows me other places that the picture has been, has been repaired. Um, and in the last um, minute and a half, let me just um, review something that was in the news quite a lot. Um, so there is a picture um, that was painted so the Night Watch is as, as we see it here on the left, but actually the Night Watch was cut down. But fortunately, before it was cut down, a small copy, only 80 centimeters wide, was made that had um, the original um, format. So it's not a very good, good picture, um, as, as you can see here. So Night Watch on the left, 
and the picture on the right. Um, but what I was able to do is to um, teach a neural network how to um, first line up the pictures very precisely, then have a neural network warp the pictures so that they would be uh, better aligned, and then I could send the neural network to art school to teach it how to translate from the style of the um, low-quality artist who made a small copy into the style of Rembrandt so that I could use the copy to have the neural network mimic um, how to translate from the style of the copy to the style of Rembrandt. I have the Rembrandt picture in the middle, but what this would then let me do is to reconstruct the missing parts of the Night Watch um, in the style of Rembrandt. So it learns his palette, it learns his painting style, it learns his chiaroscuro shading, and so on. Um, and it's nice to note that the network even learned how to mimic the crackalure pattern on the painting. Um, so the very big picture is that um, AI is used a lot at the Rijksmuseum um, to help the world access, preserve, and understand its cultural heritage. And with that, I thank you. <laughs>